We want all your mental energy focused on produ producing effort and a level of fatigue that will wake up that ancient signal. That's where the money is, okay? That's where the good stuff is, is to produce that level of fatigue, okay? And not only that, is if you do something that is so skill-based and combine that level of fatigue with a skill-based movement, you're gonna get hurt. You're gonna be slinging your kettlebell around, and you're gonna get fatigued, and you're gonna get sloppy, and then you're gonna hurt yourself. If you're doing a simplified movement, slow and smoothly, you can get to the deepest level of fatigue, and if you're doing it right, guess what? By the time you get down here, you're too weak to hurt yourself, because if you're gonna hurt yourself, you're gonna hurt yourself with force. Force is mass times acceleration. You do it slow and smooth, you eliminate acceleration. By the time you get down here, you're too weak to hurt yourself. So you're getting it done safely too, okay? But, so these five big movements, done safely, back to back, it's gonna take you 90 seconds to two minutes to reach complete muscular fatigue. Bam, 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 five, done, in and out, go home. That's basically the workout, but I'm gonna let people that are better discussing that, like Drew, give you more details about that, but that's the premise of how the workout works. Now, what I wanna do is take what you learned from Mark Sisson yesterday and do two things with that. One is I want to provide medical support for everything that he told you. And then I'm gonna show you how doing this wraps into that, okay? So, um, while I try to get this thing flipped over, does anyone have any questions thus far? Anything they wanna ask? Yes, sir. Um, based on what you just mentioned, so are you opposed to skills-based exercises or workouts? Can you clarify or expand upon that? No, I mean, to some extent, all exercises are skilled-based. But if you're going to be producing this level of fatigue, going to muscular failure, I would much rather you do it, um, you know, squatting with a spotter or on a leg press machine that's set up in such a way that you can't drop it on yourself when you get to the level of fatigue that I'm seeking out. Now, can you do a significant level of fatigue with a skill-based movement? Yeah. Um, and can you do it for a long time without getting hurt? Yeah. Did this come out backwards? Did this come out? No, it's just, uh, I think it just goes down and then flips. Oh. oh. Like that. Maybe. And then this ah. way. Cool. That'll work. So, no, I'm not completely opposed to it, but what we did in the book was we wanted to get people going with this with extremely simple movements because our focus is um, effort and not technique. What we're looking for is that depth of fatigue, and we want someone to come right out of the blocks and be able to aspire to that on day one as opposed to spend all their mental energy on trying to coordinate things. Does that answer? Okay. Um, yes, sir? Oh, not working. Could you maybe shed a little more light on the anabolic versus catabolic state? Mark mentioned it yesterday, and he said, um, basically dispelling the common wisdom that, you know, people were thinking that you need to eat every three hours or yeah. you're going to enter catabolic state. Right. Yeah. And that's true from the exercise standpoint. It's also true from the dietary standpoint. And the thing is, is no, no omnivore in nature eats three meals and two snacks a day. I mean, it's ridiculous. If you had to eat that much, you're going to get eaten. You don't have time to hunt, gather, reproduce, or do anything else. Okay? But what happens, and the reason that becomes part of our culture, as we'll discuss here, is people become metabolically deranged to the extent that they can't tap their energy stores. And as a consequence, when they feel their energy start to wane, they can't tap into their body fat or their glycogen stores because of their hormonal environment. So they need to eat right away. And the way most people that have been eating a grain-based and a high in carbohydrate diet exist as soon as their blood sugar drops, 
they got to eat something to kind of level it out. And that is the conventional wisdom's approach to managing hunger. But it's a losing battle because hunger always wins. But when you eat an appropriate evolutionary-based diet, you'll find yourself, you know, if you eat what Mark's recommended for breakfast, for instance, you just have that. After you've done that for a while, you'll be going along, and it'll be 2.30 in the afternoon, and you go, I forgot to eat lunch. And you'll find yourself wanting only two meals a day because you're eating in such a way that doesn't drive hunger, and you're eating in a way that sets your hormonal environment where you can actually experience satiety. So, but that'll come out more as we go through this. You'll see what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Um, my question is, you're doing a workout once a week and you're getting an adaptive response to that workout. How often do you have to tweak that workout because eventually you're going to get used to that workout? Do you just increase the intensity until you're the fatigue or is there, you know, a method to Yeah, you really, I mean, there are ways that you can tweak things, but you'd be surprised at how far you can go without having to change much at all, okay? Um, you'll learn a lot from Bill de Simone. Muscle and joint function really does not change much over time. And the whole concept of variety and, you know, the P90X muscle confusion and stuff like that is really not as true as they make it out to be. Um, the real key is to allow the adaptation to occur and then to step up the challenge in terms of the resistance accordingly. Now, over time, what you really have to make tweaks for is not something necessarily going on in your body, but tweaks in the mechanics of the equipment itself. Because no equipment's perfect, the strength curve of the equipment doesn't match that of your body perfectly. So there's going to be a sticking point at different places. I don't know if you've ever done a barbell squat, but you know it's much harder when you're coming out of the hole than it is when you're up almost completely standing. So what happens is the weight progresses over time that sticking point's like a speed bump. Well, when you first start, you're pushing a little Yugo over a speed bump. But as you get advanced, you're pushing a Mack truck over a speed bump. So you end up having to alternate movements that have a different location of sticking point and things like that. But really, truth be told, in terms of approaching your body's own phenotypic ma maximum, it, it almost doesn't matter. You're slicing things pretty thin at that point. Anyone else? Um, yes, af after your workout, when would you recommend for sport training? Like how much rest, say if you have to train five days a week, six days a week for your certain sport? Um, can you give me more particulars about your yeah. question or a sport per I, se? I play volleyball and our, our weightlifting program revolves a lot around squats, deadlifts, and RDLs. And usually we'll weightlift around two o'clock for an hour and then have rest and we'll practice for three hours and that's five days a week and we'll lift for three days a week because i want to talk to my coaches and my strength training coach about this and i want to ask them like, yeah you're not going to get very far with that yeah because after we do those squats i can't jump at all and it's very hard to yeah practice for three hours yeah yeah, yeah i mean it's they are indoctrinated to such an extent you're going to get nowhere with it and as long as part of your organized sport, you're kind of locked into that training paradigm, to try to add this on top of it would just be suicide. What I would suggest to you is, um, for yourself, is to try to use something that um, follows this paradigm more during your off season, leading up to the beginning of your season when all this starts, and then try to sell it by demonstrating your performance right at the beginning of the season on the conditioning that you did for yourself. Because, um, yeah, the, the folklore and coaching is just abhorrent. I mean, it's, you couldn't do it any more wrong. I mean, to be doing, you know, squats and Romanian deadlifts and a jumping athlete five and six days a week, you know, you might as well put a 40-pound weighted vest on them and have them go out and compete. I mean, they're going to be so fatigued, so ragged out. Um, and the thing is, is doing that kind of training fatigues your fastest twitch motor units, which are the ones you need most for that particular sport, but they're also the ones that are most fatigue sensitive, meaning they fatigue quickly and they recover slowly. So your most productive motor units, the 15% the 
of your muscle that is the most productive for explosive movement and jumping is just out of the equation for the entire season. It's hosed. So, but how to approach it with your coaches, I got no good answer for you. If I can't do it, I don't think you can. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and here's the real key with this. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, he went on the mic. He, he was asking is, can when you incorporate this kind of workout at the time that you're initiating a new sport for yourself like martial arts, if I got that correct? Um, yes, and the neat thing is that when you're taking on a new sport for martial arts, what you're really focusing on, even though there's a large exercise component to it and a lot of activity, what you're trying to do there is to hone a skill, to develop a skill set. So you are skill training. This has nothing to do with skill training. This is physical conditioning, which the more you separate your physical conditioning from your skill training, the better it will be. And when you do your skill training, you want to make certain that you're doing it in the freshest, most recovered state possible because you want to entrain the neuromotor pathway, sort of a dog trail in the backyard, so to speak, that is most efficient for all the skills that you're learning. Because if you're going to compete with this, you want to compete when you're fully recovered. So what you need to do is, when you're taking on your new sport, is to look at it and then back engineer your workout around your sporting activity so you make certain that when you're practicing your skill, you've had enough recovery time. And if that means pushing the workout out to every 10th day because you're having so much activity learning your skill, that's fine. You're not going to decompensate. Your body's not going to build a pound of ground round and allow it to decompensate in 14 days. It will not happen. Okay? Now, your metabolic conditioning will decompensate over 14 days, but if you're doing this other activity, that's going to be taken care of by itself. So the key becomes, this is short enough and brief enough where you can build your workout around your life and not your life around your workout. Okay. Yes. Um, this is really interesting to me and I actually have three small questions. Okay. Um, could you first please repeat the five basic movements? Then um, I wanted to know how uh, yesterday Mark Sisson was talking about um, incorporating more play activities and I wanted to know how you thought that might affect <coughs> that R part of your um, your model if you're if you're playing after you've done this kind of yeah. training and then the last one is does uh, does your approach uh, also apply to cardio exercise yes oh yeah <laughs> um, and we'll hit the cardio thing more when we do this but first the five movements are a leg press a pull down movement um, and Bill De Simone will go through the mechanics of those in great detail for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So leg press, a pull down, a chest press movement, a rowing movement, which is in the horizontal plane, and an overhead press. So that will kind of cover all the major elements of your body there. Second part of the question was the play. Um, yeah, that's very easy to incorporate because remember, we're trying to separate our physical conditioning, which is a very deliberate, um, engineered um, triggering of a, of a biologic process from other activities. But the thing you gotta remember is that play is not gonna interfere with the recovery side of the equation too much. Because if um, we look at the level of intensity, if we were to draw it on a graph with the x-axis being the edge of this stage and the y-axis going this way, if we were to draw a graph of the intensity of the workout, what we'd see is that the needle would peg, go all the way across the room, out the door and out the front door of the um, hotel. But play activity, even those that are fairly boisterous and really get you huffing and puffing and stuff like that, they're probably, in terms of measuring intensity relative to that, are not going to go beyond this first row of tables. So it does have some effect on recovery, but I think it is important to incorporate playful physical activity. And if you find in your record keeping 
that the amount of playful physical activity that you want to incorporate is not allowing you to recover by the seventh day, or let's say you're working out every fifth day, it's not working, you're not progressing, but you don't want to give up the amount of play you're doing, fine, push your workout to the seventh day. If you start showing progress again, then hold it there for a while. And then if all of a sudden you have a workout where it doesn't progress, skip a week. Then come back at every seventh day, two or three weeks, skip a week. Or you can go to every tenth day. Or you can just mix it up. Or every third workout you can flip a coin. If it's heads, you work out. If it's tails, you don't. Doesn't matter, but allow for that recovery. And allow for it in a way where your life and your play and what you want to do is in the driver's seat and not the workout. Because in the end, that will get you the best results. Yes, sir. Um, I have one question. I've actually read the book, The Red Queen by Matt Ridley, yes. and it's an awesome book. It's very informational it and answers a lot of questions <coughs> that I didn't even know that I had. But my question now is that there are these new systems for working out nutrition and health and things that are based on evolution. And through the history of evolution, our life expectancy was extremely short compared to what we're expecting to live now. So how can we base these systems on life longevity while for thousands of years we weren't living that long? Okay. Um, first is when you look at hunter-gatherer life expectancy, when you look at the anthropological studies about that, you've got to realize that that's actuarial, okay, over an entire lifespan. And the vast, vast majority of that is accounted for a skewing of the median downward by infant mortality, okay? And this is one of my favorite pet peeves as an emergency physician is it always just drives me freaking crazy when some granola head wants a nurse midwife to deliver their baby in their living room. And that shit pisses me off because when that baby comes out blue with a cord wrapped around its neck, they're dropping it in my lap on an ambulance, okay? If you have any historical graveyards in the town where you live, go visit it. Because fully one-third of the graves there are infant graves, okay? The vast majority of prehistoric humankind's mortality that made their life expectancy 30 years instead of 72 years has to do with the infant mortality associated with it or simply becoming saber-toothed tiger shit at some point in your life, okay? We, this is the beautiful thing about technology and capitalism, is we can make mistakes and not die, okay? In emergency medicine, I have a very famous saying, and I like to say it a lot. Stupidity is not a crime, but it is punishable by death. Nature is a hanging judge, and that's where our hunter-gatherer friends bit the dust. It didn't really have anything to do with anabolic, catabolic balance or long-term health benefits because there were older survivors, and the fossil evidence of those older survivors based on ligamentous attachments and bony assessment and bone mineral density was, they were extraordinarily robust, okay? The Hadza tribe that lives in uh, Central Africa is um, one of the few pure hunter-gatherer tribes that still lives as they originally did, and they don't even recognize a child as human until it has survived three lunar cycles just to psychologically protect themselves from the high infant mortality rate, which also does two things, which sort of skews Mark Sisson and my argument about why evolutionary nutrition is such a boon, is that also you have a selection bias, is if you're not good genetic material, you're not gonna make it beyond three moons, that's the way it is, so the deck is kinda loaded in their favor just from a genetic predisposition, because, um, you know, as far as someone like me, compared to your average hunter-gatherer that did survive, you know, probably to uh, quote Full Metal Jacket, the best part of me ran down the crack of my mama's ass and wound up as a brown stain on the mattress. But um, so, yeah, that, that has a point, but it doesn't 
really specifically apply when you actually parse the numbers out. Any others before we go to med school? How am I doing on time? All right, let me fly. This.